the great hero and the demon lord had a great battle. The demon lord tried to mock the hero, claiming that if he fails, the world will end. The hero grabbed a small rock and thought it was all he had remaining. The demon lord unleashed all his power and thrown a huge boulder toward the hero. But the hero countered it by using his small pebble to destroy it. The hero was tired of small games and wanted to finish it all. The demon lord accepted, and they pointed their sword toward each other. Using their most powerful abilities, the two engaged in the last confrontation. After several clashes, both were exhausted, to the point that the hero's hair turned white. Moved by their desires, the two slowly walked forward and stabbed each other. They collapsed, yet the hero was relieved that everything was over. Fast forwarding to the future, we see a young boy happy to join school. He notices the students greeting each other and asks if that's what friends do. He feels relieved because that's what normal people is supposed to do. That young boy is none other than Blade, the hero who defeated the Demon King. He jumps in happiness, mentioning that he will make friends and live as a normal person from now on. Blade happily walked in the hallway, telling himself that it was time to make some friends. He greets every random person he walks by and notices some students talking about how he seems a transferred student. He notices it and introduces himself, and finds out they're called Kasim, Clay, Jessica and Claire. He reveals that he's there to make friends and the four accept. Blade is happy that he now has four friends, but now he aims to have 100 friends. Claire tells him that for that he needs to befriend all students. Suddenly, a girl interrupts their conversation to ask why Blade is creating a commotion. She says that they're all students at the Rosewood Academy, an academy that creates heroes, so they should follow rules and order. The group reveals that she's Ernest Flaming, the strongest student in school, and is called the Empress. Yet, Blade simply introduces himself with a big smile. But Ernest doesn't care, she asks who the hell he is. Claire tries to explain that Blade just transferred in. Raid, Shadow Legends. I know most people would say that Raid is the most popular reason for people skipping ahead in videos. But Raid it's also the most fun mobile and PC MMORPG out there. There are more details in this game than in all four seasons of Sword Art Online. Raid has a top 3 champions that, in my opinion, can defeat everyone with just their badass looks. The first is Judge, who attacks all enemies twice. But I think just one condemning glance from him will be enough. Then there's Sisha Flame Tongue. Just look at that fire all around her body. No creature would want to become a grilled chicken. And finally, there's Turvald. He literally shows that he will defeat anyone who says something unnecessary with his horns or just with his super cool weapon. In this game, you will find always something new like an epic limited series that is happening right now, Call of the Arbiter. To celebrate this, Raid's adding some of the new characters from the series as champions you can play with in-game. Awesome, right? Among them is Ardak, a formidable orc warlord. What's even more exciting is that Ardak will be accessible to all players completely free of charge. To claim this fantastic opportunity, log into Raid for 7 consecutive days between now and July 24th. If you haven't started playing yet then what are you waiting for? Use my link in the description or scan my QR code to get awesome rewards such as a free epic champion, knight errant, and other useful things to begin your journey to like energy refills, skill tome and XP booster. Thanks, Raid, for sponsoring the video. But Ernest still doesn't care, claiming that this school only admits people who want to be heroes, and they shouldn't accept late admissions. Yet, Blade drops the ball when he mentions he doesn't care about becoming a hero. He's only here to make friends. Ernest goes on a tantrum because he doesn't have any resolve to protect people. Yet, Blade doesn't care and asks her to take him to the principal's office. She shows him the way and knocks the door. The principal tells them to get in, and when Ernest sees the principal's face, she bows down in respect. Blade doesn't care about it, and talks to the principal in a casual tone. Ernest grabs his leg and calls him an idiot. She asks if he knows who the principal is, and Blade is like, sure I do. She then starts begging the principal to forgive the new student, because he doesn't know that the principal is the king. The king laughs it off, mentioning that he heard about Ernest from the previous headmaster and reveals that he's now the new school principal. Ernest starts complimenting the king, like any loyal subordinate would do, but she almost never ends licking his boots. Gladly, the king tells her that's enough and that she should leave because he needs to speak to Blade in private. She gets out and gets mad because Blade treats the king just like a casual friend. Blade then blames the king, because he just got on her bad side because of the whole situation. He asks the king what he is doing here, and the king reveals that Blade lost his powers after the fight with the demon lord, and he wants him to regain his hero powers. Blade gets annoyed because he wants to be an ordinary person, but the king ignores him, calling this school just a rehabilitation center for Blade. The king continues ignoring Blade, and explains he will change the school curriculum. 
He wants to create great heroes, just like Blade was. The young boy tries to dismiss it as unnecessary because the Demon King is dead. The King mentions the report about Blade's last battle against the Demon King, resulting on both losing their powers. Yet, he believes that there's a way to restore Blade's power. Blade is still pretty annoyed, because the King always acted like this, but he decides to ignore it. Blade returns to class, where everyone is doing their own thing. He notices Ernest and tries to talk to her. She asks him what is he doing in the S class. Blade explains he took the exam for F classes but he was told to come here. She thinks he bribed someone to get into the school, and the S class. She explains that this isn't a school that admits people half-hearted to get in, and claims that he cheated. Blade claims he's dead serious in this school. He wants to make 100 friends. He starts introducing himself to every person around, claiming he wants to be friends with them. Ernest gets annoyed by his actions, but he suddenly pats her head. She gets shy and tries to attack him with her sword, but Blade swiftly jumps to dodge her attack. Another student named Sophie interrupts them to tell that the instructor told them to assemble. Blade introduces himself to her twice, but she only ignores him. Ernest then explains what he's doing, and the girl introduces herself as Sophie. Blade starts shaking her hand, yet, Ernest calls the instructor. She tells that she wants to test Blade's ability, the teacher tries to stop it, but surrenders after being intimidated. She gets an enchanted metal armor, and tells that every S-class student can easily slice through it. She tells that he must also do it to prove his power, or he must leave the academy. She tries to explain that S-class is on a different level compared to the remaining ones. But Blade is like, how many levels are we talking about? She replies that they're at least three levels above the rest. Blade is slightly impressed and decides to use his second sword skill. He unleashes his fighting spirit, impressing everyone around. They notice it's the rarest and strongest Dragon Series spirit. Blade accumulates the power around his sword and unleashes the skill Dragon Eater. This is a wind skill that not only completely crushes the enchanted armor into dust, as it also rips off Ernest's clothes, and knocks every student except for Sophie against the wall. Ernest then comes back and asks how the hell is Blade. After looking around, Blade notices what happened and apologizes, claiming that he's an ordinary person. The class ends and it's lunchtime, Ernest is eating alone in her spot. Blade decides to join her and calls his friends to join them, but they all refuse to. Ernest explains that table is reserved for her, but he confuses the situation. He asks if she's being bullied, but she calls him an idiot and reveals that everyone is afraid of her. He wants to know why, but she ignores him. After tasting his food, Blade starts to eat like he never had a meal in his life. She's confused because it's just curry, yet she apologized for telling that he bribed someone to join the school. But Blade didn't even remember that situation. She admits that he has some talent, but Blade is focused on his food. On the other hand, Blade thanks her because she helped him realizes his dream of having friends. She's confused, but he tells that since they're eating together, they're now friends. Ernest gets as red as tomato, and tells that she doesn't mind being his friend. Later at night, Ernest gets back to her room and reflects on his words. She initially calls him an idiot, but then starts rolling on her bed, happy that she managed to make her first friend. Suddenly, her sword starts shacking, making her remember her past. When she was younger, she immediately felt an attraction toward her sword. Yet, when she approached, the sword told her to surrender herself to it. Ernest fell into those words, and picked up the sword, her hair turned from black to red. And since then, the sword has been filling her mind with words to destroy, slash and burn. The sword repeats those words, but Ernest tells it to shut up. She's the next head of her family and she won't give in to the demonic sword. She manages to calm down the sword and felt determined to get stronger. The next day, they continue their practice lessons, but she's annoyed that her opponent is not taking the fight seriously. This guy is the type of playboy who doesn't want a lady to get hurt. The guy then falls back to activate the power of his lance, which Blade thinks it's amazing, and rushes forward, just to get thrown away like Team Rocket. The guy puts his playboy face and admits defeat, but suddenly, Ernest loses control is about to kill him. She manages to stop the swing in time and calls for her next opponent. Sophie steps in and the two start their battle. She manages to block Ernest's attacks with her punches and even manages to push her back. Ernest is forced to use a fire skill and Sophie admits defeat. She then calls Blade to fight her, but he's worried about her condition. She tells that she's fine and gets into her posture. Yet, she suddenly drops her sword and faints after feeling the sword trying to consume her. Blade manages to catch her in time and takes her to the infirmary. He tries to convince the doctor to make Ernest feel better, just like she did to him after defeating the demon lord. 
but she explains she cannot do something against spells and curses. Ernest then wakes up, confused about what happened. Blade tries to explain, but she gets startled and tries to get up. Blade stops her and explains everything. Ernest wants to leave, but the doctor tells her to rest. Blade promises that he will take care of Ernest and helps her get back. She says that she can walk by herself, but Blade tells her that she can lean on him because they're friends. But she simply tells him to keep what happened a secret and walks away. Blade then decides to infiltrate in the data system of the Academy to get information about her. He finds out that Ernest has the demon sword named Asmodeus. He decides to call her out to talk in private. She misunderstands his intentions, thinking it's something romantic. But he says that he knows the secret about her sword. Outside, he explains that her sword gives her more power, but since the sword has free will, the sword doesn't accept her as its master. He asks how it did happens, and she explains that she found the sword when she was six, and that the sword tried to take over her body, since then she's still trying to battle against the sword urges. Blade then tells the only way to stop it is for the sword to acknowledge her as its owner, but she's afraid to try it, because if she fails, the demon will take her body and kills thousands of innocent people. Yet, Blade tells her that it's okay. She gets mad, but Blade tells her he can handle it, and if it's needed, he will destroy the sword. She decides to believe him and starts the ritual to form a pact. Blade watches her from the side, as he sees flames surrounding her body. After finishing the chant, the demon sword increases the flames to test her. Ernest sees herself in front of the demon and she orders it to submit to her. Yet, the demon refuses to surrender forcing them into a fight. The flames start to generate some sort of small demons, wishing to destroy everything. One of the demons tries to attack Blade, but he destroys it with his punch. After watching the scene, Ernest believes that Blade will take care of everything if she fails. She decides to give it her all and decides to go all out against the demon. The two clashes with their powers, and with Blade's support, she manages to win the battle and control the sword. Blade catches Ernest as she falls from the sky and congratulates her for succeeding. From that moment on, Ernest changed her habits. She starts to greet students with a smile instead of being moody, all thanks to her first friend, Blade. The day continues as usual until class starts. Blade ends up practicing against two students, but he simply dodges every single attack. Ernest comes to him and tells him to at least draw his sword against his colleagues. She also mentions that he's disrespecting them because he's not even looking at them while fighting. But Blade simply replies that she looks different. She acts flirty asking how she looks different to him. Blade thinks of all of the moments she was smiling and acting cute, until he simply replies that he doesn't know. Leonard starts attacking Blade while telling him to notice when a girl changes her hairstyle. Of course, Blade didn't even notice it. Ernest reaches a level of depression that says that she didn't want him to notice, but she goes back to serious mode and tells Blade to keep an eye on Sophie. He notices her practicing by herself and asks Ernest why is it. Ernest says that Sophie always practices by herself, but she usually obeys every command she's given. But she never did something she wanted to, except for the time when she told her name to him. Ernest tells him to deal with Sophie, while ordering Leonard to work harder. Blade goes to Sophie, introduces himself, and says that Ernest asked him to watch over her training. Sophie asks if that's a command. Blade ends up confused because that wasn't an order, but she asked him to do it. Still, he simply smiles and tells that he wants to help her. Sophie looks at her fists and says that's all she can use. Blade curiously asks why she doesn't use weapons. She simply replies that she was only taught to use her body to fight. Blade promises to teach her other ways to fight. She asks if it's a command. Blade simply replies he's trying to help a friend, and if she doesn't want to, she doesn't need to learn. She's curious about it and decides to give it a try. Blade prepares to practice with her, but the bell rings, signaling their practical training is over. Blade is flustered because they were about to start. Ernest replies that's because he was flirting. Sophie then looks at Blade and gives him a smile. In the next practical training class, Blade teaches Sophie how to use a sword, but she cannot still cut through the armor. Blade tells her to channel her fighting spirit into the sword, just like she does with her fists. He tells her that a sword is just an extension of her body while demonstrating. She easily understands and manages to cut through the armor. Blade tells that if she keeps going, she will be able to use the sword. He decides to call it for a day, but Sophie asks if she will beat Ernest. Blade replies that getting to Ernest's level won't be easy. Suddenly, Sophie throws the sword back at Blade. He grabs it, but Sophie grabs him and throws him to the floor in the next second. She sits on top of him to restrain him and says this way is stronger. Blade agrees and says that he can't move. She replies while getting her face closer that she wouldn't be in a good mount position if the enemy could move freely. Blade agrees and she tells him that she wants to learn something else from him tomorrow. 
Blade promises he will do it. But first, he must visit the school principal, if you don't remember, the king. The king asks how school life is going, to which Blade replies that he made some friends. The king feels relieved because Blade became the hero when he was still three years old. Don't ask me how. At this point, the king even considers Blade his best friend. But Blade wants to be friends with people around his age. The king is curious and asks who Blade's friends are. Blade mentions he's been lately closer to Sophie. The king isn't surprised, he already expected that Blade would be interested in her. The two comments on how strong she is, but the king states that she's still incomplete. Blade is confused, but the king explains their goal for her completed form was to surpass Blade. Blade gets mad and asks what this is about. The king mocks him for befriending her without knowing she was part of the artificial great hero project. Blade is once again confused. The king explains that if Blade, the great hero, can exist, then there's also the possibility to create an artificial great hero just like him. He basically explains there's a certain group who used ancient forbidden knowledge to create an artificial hero. They took a test subject with the best aptitude and tried to artificially manifest the great hero's powers. To make it worse, they created several clones of her for that experiment, and they used them to make new experiments and adjustments. Blade is confused about the clones because he thought they were thinking about Sophie. The king reveals Sophie's real name is Sophisha Femto. Femto signifies 12, which means she's the 12th clone of Sophisha. Blade's eyes are shaking as he cannot believe the truth. The king continues by saying that the original Sophisha was treated as an object to be experimented on. Blade angrily gets up, but the king explains that he wasn't involved. Plus, he took that organization down. Blade calms down, but the king explains the moment he met Sophie. He took her in and told her that she was free. But she also asked if that was a command, something that hasn't changed since then. Blade rushes back and blames himself because Sophie was robbed of a normal life because they wanted to create a great hero. But now, he's decided to make sure she gets her normal life back. The problem is that he doesn't know what's a normal life too. He goes to the infirmary to talk with his medic friend, who's more interested in seeing his body. He asks her what normal means and what's normal for a kid of his age. She's happy that he's curious and she's willing to teach him everything related to the vigor of youth. And Glad misunderstood her words because I wouldn't. He goes to Leonard and asks what youth does mean and what it involves. Leonard is also dumb and replies that it means love. Blade dashes away and asks his colleagues what is love and what they do when they're in love. One of them replies that love is about going on dates together. As you guess, it's time for the next victim. He goes to Ernest's room and asks about dates. She misunderstands the whole situation, but due to Blade's insistence, she replies that it's couples spending time alone. They talk, walk around, and go shopping. But despite being happily shy about it, she says it's too early for them to go on a date. Blade storms off, telling he will be going on a date. Of course, Ernest wants to know who's the girl stealing her spot. While looking for Sophie, Blade enters heaven, I mean the girl's bathroom, and asks Sophie on a date. She replies if that's in order. It isn't, but he tells that's important. She smiles and agrees. Of course, girls including Ernest decide to spy on the two while mentioning what happened. The girls are still calling Ernest the Empress, and she tells them to simply call her Ernest. The girls refuse, but Ernest explains their comrades united with one single goal. To keep an eye on Blade and prevent him from doing funny business, I wonder what she means by that. Sophie arrives at the meeting spot on time and tells Blade she doesn't have an idea of what a date is. Blade replies with, don't worry I've planned everything. Of course, his agenda sounds more like a mission briefing. The girls think this is too detailed and that it really sounds like a date. Sophie holds onto his arm, and they start walking. Ernest and the girls don't like that interaction and end up losing them. Turns out Blade planned to walk around the city, eat some ice cream, visit some spots, run around, and even feed the fish. They then go to an arcade to play the punching game. Ernest and the girls are pretty jealous and want to stop them. Why you ask? Because they destroy the bloody machine. Blade becomes a bit more romantic and the two have to drink from the same fruit at the same time with their straws. But since it's hard to sip, Sophie asks him to get closer to her. Suddenly, Blade jumps away when their faces touch. She asks him what is wrong, but he doesn't understand. Sophie tells him she cannot complete the mission of finishing the drink by herself. He replies that he understands, but his heart is going faster than a race car. They shyly get near each other to finish the drink, and Sophie tells him to get closer. Blade's heart is reaching its limit, but Ernest and the girls are annoyed because they haven't been noticed despite sitting one table away. Ernest's mind is also racing, annoyed by seeing them close. After moving forward with their date, Blade finally starts to feel like someone is following them. 
They still ignore it and try to move forward with their activities. But Blade notices they're a bit late. Sophie says that it's okay and they will take a shortcut. And by that I mean, climbing a building, and then jumping among the city buildings. Then end the date sitting by a fountain, where Sophie reveals she had fun today. She then asks why he decided to call her on a date. He wants to tell the truth but he can't, so he replies that it's because she's his friend. Sophie asks if they're really friends because friends don't keep secrets from each other. Blade thinks he was caught, but she then says that she hasn't told him something. She decides to reveal to him that she isn't a normal human. She explains the whole incomplete test subject story and shows the power she got from it. She says the real hero can change the laws of physics, but she cannot control the power. She falls down and says that she wanted to increase her body weight by a thousand times. But since she cannot control her power, she actually increased it by 10,000. She also reveals that she can stop time, but she can only use the hero powers for 10 seconds. After hearing her whole story, Blade tells her that he won't also keep any secrets from her. She wants to listen to it, and Blade reveals that they used to call him the great hero. Sophie doesn't reply and Blade explains that he lost his powers. Since she's silent, he asks if she knew already. She replied that she didn't, but she felt something familiar coming from him. He apologizes to her, because he is the reason she became a test subject for this cursed power and lost her normal life. Sophie doesn't understand the curse part. Blade explains that the hero's power is a curse. He never wanted to be the great hero, but he had no choice but to fight because they told him that he could use the power to save people. He started to fight monsters when he was only three years old. That was the time his powers had awakened. He became strong and almost died several times, but there were still people he couldn't save. People would be angry at him when he couldn't save their loved ones. Blade starts to cry and Sophie runs toward him to comfort him. She says that even if didn't he want to be it, he was still the great hero. She reveals that after being rescued by the king, she went out on a journey to find out who she was. She mentions all the cities he saved and all the people he also saved. He holds her tight while she tells him to be proud. He says that's impossible, but Sophie replies that she is proud that she took part in the artificial great hero experiment because she wants to become someone like him. After hearing those words, Blade decides that he won't be haunted by his past anymore. The two hold hands and promise that they will keep his real identity a secret. Blade and his fellow classmates were enjoying their lunch in the cafeteria when Ernest mentions Blade had food all over his face. Sophie kindly helped clean his face, making Ernest complain out of jealousy. Her new friends arrive and ask if they can join them. They end up joining them and one of the girls asks for Blade's opinion on their outfits. Blade is confused, but Ernest interrupts and congratulates the group for being promoted in class to their class. Blade is still confused, and the students mention only s rank students can dress freely. The girl asks what Blade thinks again, but he thinks she's cold with that outfit. Of course, Leonard is here to pick up girls and tries his best. Ernest tells him to stay down and asks if Blade knew about the news. The king is bringing a magical beast to the school to improve the training. Blade doesn't care about it, which surprises Ernest. He mentions that he couldn't expect less from the old fart king. Suddenly, the ground starts shaking, making the students in panic. Sophie tells Blade they should take everyone to the shelter, but he rushes with his plate still in his hand. They find a dragon, and Blade asks if that's a magical beast. Blade slowly walks forward, and the dragon moves into him after seeing him. Ernest prepared to fight, but Sophie stopped her. Blade then suddenly jumps into the air, and knocks the dragon down with a punch while telling it to sit. Ernest cannot understand what's going on. How did Blade deal with the dragon with only one punch? He replies that this dragon is still young, and he must have been scared while being dragged here. He asks if the dragon is hungry and throws his plate inside its mouth. But it's too spicy for the dragon and Blade laughs. The students were amazed at Blade's ability to pacify the dragon with a single blow. Blade tried to downplay it mentioning this is normal and everyone could do it. Nobody believed him. He says that it's not a great dragon or an ancient one, it's just a baby dragon. Everyone stepped back, scared of him, when the dragon suddenly starts to shine. Ernest tells Blade to look behind where he sees a little girl. She jumps on him calling him father, but Blade doesn't understand. She claims she's been looking for him and now wants to play. Blade replies that he's not her father, but he will help her find her parents later. He then asks Ernest where the dragon went. She tries to explain the dragon became that little girl, but he says that's impossible. Despite Blade's attempts to convince her otherwise, the girl persisted in her belief that he was her father. Ernest explained the dragon had shapeshifted into the girl, and Sophie confirmed this, finally convincing Blade. The girl jumped on him and he asks why is she calling him father. She ignores his question, mentioning his punch is amazing. 
and she couldn't expect less from her father. She clings to him, asking to play, and Blade doesn't know what to do. They then decided to let Blade care for her to prevent her from going on a rampage. While bathing the little girl, whom he named Ku, asked why he gave her that name. Blade explained that he chose after a strong knight who always kept promises. This pleased Ku, because dragons also keep a promise, even if it costs their life. Ernest interrupted the bath and got shy after seeing his chest. He asks if she did learn anything about the girl. She mentions that magical beasts like dragons are creatures who seek strength. Once they're defeated, their flesh decays, but they leave a fragment of their soul with their knowledge. That fragment then can be incarnated as another entity and copies the shape of the being that defeated them. In short, Blade concludes a dragon can take a human form if defeated by a human. Ernest explains it's rare because most humans cannot defeat a dragon. Blade realizes she's talking about his strength, and he wondered if Ku had been defeated by a human in her past life. Ernest realizes that Blade decided to name the dragon. The girl revealed herself, mentioning she likes her name. Ernest sees Blade was taking a shower with Ku and kicks his face while calling him a pervert. The following day, Ernest was still annoyed, especially because Ku was sitting on Blade's lap. Ku asked him to feed her, and Blade did it. Ku mentions she's capable of feeding herself, but being fed by Blade makes it taste better. Claire thinks Ku is cute and tries to feed her. But Ku becomes aggressive, mentioning she won't be friends with weak humans. Blade tells Ku that she scared Claire, but Ku replies that he should only pay attention to her, his daughter. She mentions that he must give her a good morning kiss and she must sit on his lap for him to feed her during mealtime, to which he agrees. Every girl is shocked and asks if Blade kisses her in the morning. He mentions he never did it. Ku then mentions Blade spends his time staring at mature female bodies, which she thinks it's unacceptable. The girls take this seriously and confront him, and the boys backstab him. They claim he is guilty and punish him by leaving him alone during training. Ernest recommended that their classmates not worry about him. Blade then notices Ku walking by and asks if she wants to join him. She happily joins, mentioning she doesn't need to train, but since he asked, she will show off power. The group that just joined their class was told to partner with Blade. Jessica said she wanted to become a spy and asked who could teach her, Blade recommended Sophie. But Ku felt like he was ignoring him and left. He tries to call her up, but she already disappeared. Ku was walking around school and noticed a group of students training. They asked if she wanted to join them and become friends. But Ku replied they were too weak to fight her. She ran away and bumped into Blade. He noticed she was feeling down and asked what was wrong. She dismissed it and told him she was starving. He told her they were going to get some curry. She hugged him and said he knew her too well. After their meal, Blade watches Ku fall asleep. He pokes her face and she holds his finger. Ernest knocks on his door and the two go outside. He explains to her that dragons are tormented by their parents when they're born. They only do that because the child only recognizes their parents due to their strength. Ernest asks if that's the reason why Ku behaves like that. He replies that Ku has been alone since she was born. Ernest tells him that he cannot pretend to be Ku's father for longer. Blade agrees, but he's afraid that Ku will end up truly alone in the world. He asks if Ernest knows how much it hurts to be alone. She then realizes what he's trying to say and now knows that Blade is serious when he decided to take care of Ku. She then asks if Sophie is reassured, revealing that she was listening to everything. Ernest and Sophie were worried about him, and Blade says that things are going well with Ku. The girls head back, to avoid any scandalous rumors. But when Blade enters his room, he notices Ku isn't there. He goes to the roof and asks her what's wrong. Ku replies that looking at the moons calms her down. She sees them as representations of parent and child. Blade understands what's going on and asks if she doesn't want to make friends. Ku says he's wrong because dragons are stronger than humans, both physically and mentally. Dragons did not form friendships and they live and die alone. She doesn't need friends, she only needs her parent, Blade. Blade plays it around and tells she's indeed strong. The next day, Blade tried to make the king babysit Ku, but it didn't go as planned. The king scared Ku, and she ran off, leaving Blade frustrated with the king's antics. Blade returned to his room and heard Ku's voice. He peeked inside to see her playing with toys and acting out a drama with them. He noticed that each toy imitated a personality from one of his friends. Ku's play portrayed Blade seeking friendship from everyone for her sake. She then starts mentioning names of students that Blade never talked to. He realizes those are the other students they passed by while walking around. The toy named Blade then mentions that his daughter managed to make 108 friends. Blade realizes that Ku wishes to have friends but claims she doesn't. He walks away, disappointed that he never noticed it. 
Ernest approached him, offering to help search for Ku, but she was stunned when Blade started banging his head against the wall repeatedly. She stopped him she asked him what was wrong. Blade explained that it was challenging for Ku to make friends because dragons didn't see weaker beings as equals. To be Ku's friend, they would have to defeat her in a fight. He felt powerless to help Ku find the friendship she desired. Ernest urged Blade to rely on her and others instead of trying to handle everything on his own. They made their way to meet the lower classes and ask for their help in the fight. Blade talked about Ku, explaining her desire to befriend them and asking for their assistance in defeating her. But the students knew they couldn't defeat a dragon. Blade begged on his knees for them to become Ku's friends, and Ernest repeated his actions. The remaining students from S class also arrive and beg on their knees. They want Ku to finally get some friends. The students couldn't believe their eyes and ended up agreeing with the request. The next day, everyone waited for Ku's arrival at the arena. She comes in her dragon form and notices the king watching from afar, enjoying the scene. The secretary asks if a dragon will acknowledge defeat if it's taken down by a large group. But the king thinks it will because dragons know humans work in groups. The king feels sad because Blade won't join the fight. But Blade almost tells Ku that it's okay if she burns the king into crispy royal bacon. He then pats her head and mentions that she couldn't fight when she was captured because of a trap. But this time, there are no traps, she can show everyone her strength. She breathes from fire and everyone prepares to start the battle. Watch this next video. See you on the next one.